There we go. Good and gracious God, thank you for the beauty of this day, which you've allowed us to enjoy with you. And uh, we, we look forward to our time with you this evening in your word. Um, the Apostle Paul is someone that uh, was truly an unlikely choice, and yet you chose him uh, to be your delegate, your apostle, your servant. And uh, we're grateful that you did because his writings speak to us, uh, sometimes in ways that, uh, as Peter said, are difficult to understand, but uh, we want to probe more deeply into uh, who he is and, and uh, how you got hold of him tonight. And we pray that your spirit would come and be our teacher and bless us as we study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So that's what I want to try to do is to uh, talk with you a little bit about Paul's early life uh, before his uh, conversion is what we call it usually. But I'm going to call it his experience of the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And I'm going to tell you why I prefer that, that title um, and a little bit later on. So, but I see that I've got allow participants to mute themselves. I don't want to do that. So there you go. Sorry, you guys are all muted now. And I'm ready to go. Here we go. Just switch the slide like that. There we go. Okay, so I want to talk about Paul and his life before and after his encounter with the risen Christ, uh, his so-called conversion. Um, this is a, a lecture that I give uh, to my seminary class in New Testament introduction, and uh, I'm going to try to adapt a little bit, uh, but you all are getting seminary class for free tonight, so enjoy. At the end of the account in the book of Acts of Stephen's trial and martyrdom, that happens in Acts chapter 7. At the end of that, Luke introduces us to a person whose life and mission dominates the larger half, the second half of the book of Acts. Chapters 13 through 28 is the larger or second half of the book of Acts. Um, this person's Jewish name, Luke tells us, was Saul. But we know him better by the name that came to him as a Roman citizen. It's his Roman cognomen. That's the Latin term for it. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about a Roman cognomen a little bit later. But uh, his Roman cognomen in Latin was Paulus. And when it comes across in English, you drop the U.S. and it just becomes Paul. Paul's conversion, which is the traditional name given to Paul's encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, and the missionary journeys that followed that encounter are foundational events for what we would call today Christianity. For from them, the book of Acts says, came the spread of the gospel and the formation of communities of people who came to identify themselves eventually as Christians. They belong to groups of people that are identified in Paul's letters as ecclesia. The word means a gathering of people, and it's used in, in secular contexts outside the New Testament. But it means a group of people who are gathered together out of the world in general for a specific purpose. And when Paul uses the term ecclesia, what he means is gatherings of people called out of the world and called into relationship with God's kingdom and with Christ, and with one another, through the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. As the prologue to Acts says, the gospel written by Luke was intended by its author to record what Jesus began to do and teach. That's the, the way that Acts opens. It says, I want, to, I want to tell you what Jesus began to do and teach in this gospel. Um, and what Luke is doing is trying to talk about that in terms of Jesus' life on earth as he preached the good news of the kingdom and called disciples into relationship with the kingdom through their relationship with him. The book of Acts, likewise, uh, probably is intended by Luke to record how the risen Christ continued to do and teach. Uh, somebody must be unmuted. Let me see. Try again. All right. Got it now. The book of Acts um, is probably intended by Luke to record how the risen Christ continued to do and teach through his spirit and his apostles. Apostles, persons delegated by Christ to do work empowered by the spirit. And Jesus continues to teach and preach the good news of the gospel and call women and men into relationship with him 
and into God's kingdom through faith in Christ, through the work and the words of his delegates, his apostles, who are empowered by his spirit to carry on his work. That's Luke's perspective. And so Luke writes two volumes, a gospel where Jesus begins to do and teach, and a book we call Acts. Some people call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Other people call it the Acts of the Apostles. Um, but the, uh, the book itself simply is the book of Acts. I keep trying to mute everybody, and it keeps saying I'm okay. there. Seems to be saying that you're trying to unmute us, the notification I'm getting. Yeah, well, I've got on my screen says current new participants will be muted, and I say yes to that. And it does it for a while. I guess somebody new must have signed on. That, that maybe that interrupted the whole thing. I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Carolyn asked if I was still recording, being a good wife. So let me tell you a little bit about Saul's early life. And I'm going to do it in two parts. First of all, I'm going to look at the evidence of Acts. In the book of Acts, Luke gives us two brief glances back at Saul's early life before writing about his experience on the road to Damascus. And those two brief experiences are what I want to look at. The first one comes in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. And there we learn that Paul was present at the stoning of Stephen. And we can infer from that that he was present at Stephen's trial, most probably present at the trial that preceded the stoning, and that Saul heard Stephen's speech, the one that Luke records in Acts chapter 7. The second glance back at, at Saul's early life in the book of Acts is in Acts chapter 9 and verses 1 and 2, where we learn that after the stoning of Stephen, Paul was involved as someone who Luke records as breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Now, both of those texts and acts are seeking to demonstrate to us when we read them, Saul's state of mind by giving us brief vignettes of Saul and portraying him as a young man intensely loyal to Judaism. And the three pillars of Judaism in the first century all begin with the letter T when you translate them into English. Torah the law, the temple, and the traditions of Judaism that emerge out of the law. Torah, temple, and tradition define first century Judaism. Saul in the book of Acts is portrayed to us as someone before and after his conversion, for that matter, who is intensely loyal to Torah, temple, and tradition, but his understanding of that loyalty changes after his encounter on the road to Damascus with the risen Christ. So these three things, Torah, temple, and tradition, are identification marks of first century Judaism before Christ came and preached, and now must be reinterpreted in terms of their significance in relationship to Christ as the Son of God and his preaching of the good news of the kingdom, which is the gospel. And it is that process of reinterpretation or fulfillment or completion that we call the change from old covenant to new covenant. But it is really one covenant. It's not leaving aside the old to pick up the new, not setting aside the old to begin something new, but completing something that was begun in the old and is fulfilled in the new. To Saul and to many other Jews in and outside Jerusalem, to say this, that the Son of God had come into the world and begun what they would have considered to be the, uh, the end of time fulfillment of the old covenant in the Messianic age, that would have been tantamount to blasphemy. And that is what led to Jesus' crucifixion, where God marked him out as, in Saul's mind, not Messiah, but as one who had been cursed by God. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, Cursed is a body that hangs on a tree. And that this was Saul's understanding before his conversion is made clear when Paul, after his conversion, writes those very same words in Galatians 3. 
By the time Paul writes them in Galatians, though, he has come to understand the curse refers to the curse not upon Jesus by God, but for our sins that Jesus willingly bore. He bore the curse for us, Paul says in Galatians. But when we first meet him in Acts 8 and 9, he's not yet met the risen Christ. He's not yet come to understand what he'll later understand. So we're looking at Paul's early life, and let's now turn from those two brief little glances in the book of Acts. Let's turn to the five key texts about who Saul was before he encountered the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. If you want to write these down, they're worth looking at, and I'll talk about all of them. But, um, and I apologize, I didn't have time to make any slides for you. I'm, I'm teaching right now, and uh, it takes up uh, most of my time, so I didn't have time to do the slideshow for you. But I'll put this whole lecture up verbatim, my lecture notes for you on the church website, and, and you'll be able to see it there if you don't write these down now. But five key texts that have to do with Saul's early life. Three of them come from the book of Acts. Two of them come from Paul's own letters. The three that come from the book of Acts are found in Acts chapter 21, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. 21, 22, and 26. The two that come from Paul's letters are found in Galatians 1 and 2 and in Philippians 3. So it's a 1, 2, 3. One text is found in Galatians 1 and 2, and the other one in Philippians 3. These are the five key texts that tell us something about Saul's life before he was, before he was converted, as, as traditionally said. So let me run through them with you, and let's see what we find out. If I were to ask you that question tonight, what do you know about Paul's life before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus? My experience doing that with folks in churches and even in seminary classes is pretty much blank stares. But there's actually quite a bit that we know about Saul before he met Christ on the road to Damascus. So let me run through it with you. According to Acts 22 and verse 3, Saul was born in a city called Tarsus, which at the time of his birth, probably around 8 to 10 A.D., was part of the Roman province of Cilicia, it was called. And the province of Cilicia had been under Roman rule for around 70 years by the time Saul was born. During the whole of his lifetime, the city of Tarsus, Saul's birthplace, was the provincial capital, and it was one of the leading cities. Its status derived first from its commercial importance, and bear with me, you're probably thinking, what in the world is it going to have to do with Saul? Hang in there, you'll see. Tarsus had a prime location. It was on a river, on the Sindus River. It was about 30 miles south of a major mountain pass. So think Seattle. Think Cascades, okay? Because Tarsus is the place where you would come through the mountains onto an eastern plateau and eventually a western coastal plain and the Mediterranean Sea. It was a very prosperous city. It was probably a great city to grow up in. It was known in particular for its textile industry. Textiles were woven there, especially two kinds of cloth. One was a kind of linen that was really popular in the hotter locations of Turkey and the rest of the Roman Empire. It was called Tarsian linen. The second kind of cloth was what you might call the ancient Gore-Tex, the Gore-Tex of the ancient world. It was water repellent. It was called Cilicium because it came from the province of Cilicia. And it was a cloth made out of goat's hair. And it was used mostly to make rain repellent coats or cloaks and rain repellent tents. 
Remember Paul was a tent maker? Hang on to that. Tarsus also had a reputation for itself as a city where education was highly prized, where forms of Greco-Roman culture flourished. Saul speaks to a Roman tribune who rescues him from a mob who's about to stone him in the temple in Acts chapter 21. And he tells the Roman where he's from, Tarsus, he says. It is no mean city. It is no podunk little town. In Saul's later letters, as Paul is writing to the Philippians in chapter 3, he tells us more about his upbringing. He was born of Jewish parents who were members of the tribe of Benjamin. And that explains his Hebrew name. Because if you know your Old Testament, you know that Saul is Israel's first king, and he's a member of the tribe of Benjamin. So if you're an American and you name your son George, maybe you name him after the first president of the United States. But Saul's parents named him for the first king of Israel, who just happened to come from the tribe that his parents belonged to, the tribe of Benjamin. So Saul's first name was his Hebrew name, Saul. His second name would have been the name of his tribe, Saul of Benjamin. His third name was his Roman cognomen. His Roman cognomen. And it has to do with the fact that Paul and his family before him were Roman citizens. Not everybody got a Roman cognomen. You had to be a Roman citizen to get a Roman cognomen. At the end of the speech in the temple that I told you about a moment ago, Paul is taken out of the temple courts into the Roman barracks that are part of the Antonio Fortress in the corner of the temple. They're barracks for Roman troops who are charged with preserving order in the temple. And the Romans intend to find out what this guy is all about and why all the other Jews are so upset with him in the temple. And the way they're going to do it is they're going to flog him. They're going to scourge him as Jesus was scourged until he tells them the truth about why everyone is so angry at him. And this is the way that Acts tells the story. This is Acts 22, beginning in verse 25. But when they had tied him up with thongs to the pole where he would be scourged, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who's uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went to the tribune, the guy in charge of the forces in the Antonia Fortress. And the tribune came and asked Paul personally, tell me the truth. Are you really a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. And the tribune answered to test him. It cost me a large sum of money to get my citizenship. And it truly was a test because he probably asked and told Paul that information, expecting Paul to say, I did the same thing. That would have been the wrong answer. But Paul said instead, I didn't buy my citizenship. I was born a citizen. And immediately, Luke says, those who were about to examine him by scourging drew back from him. And the tribune also became afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. Now, how the right of citizenship had been obtained by Saul's family before he was born, we don't know, but we can speculate. Citizenship could have well been granted to Saul's family because they were tent makers. Remember that? Tent makers. Maybe they made tents. We know this happened. And in gratitude for their service in donating the tents to the Roman army, they were granted Roman citizenship. It would have been worth more 
than what the Roman army would have paid them in money. What we do know is that Saul's Roman citizenship was something that he highly valued, that his privileges and protections were something he called on during his missionary journeys and his imprisonments and his trials. In addition, with his citizenship, he'd also inquired, acquired his Roman cognomen, his third name, Saul is his first name, of Benjamin. The tribal name is his second name, it's his family name. A tribe is a family, a big extended family. Saul of Benjamin, and his Roman cognomen is Paulus. The privileges and protections of Roman citizenship had been laid down in a series of Roman laws dating back to the formation of the Roman Republic all the way back to 509 BC. They included, among other things, the right to an impartial and public trial for any Roman citizen accused of a crime. That's a right that Paul makes use of in Acts 16 when he arrives in Philippi. It's also a right that he makes use of in Acts 18 when he arrives in Corinth. So that's one right that you got as a result of being a Roman citizen. Sometimes I hear people talk about the fact that there are no rights in the New Testament. But Paul certainly would have disagreed with that and said quickly, I'm a Roman citizen, and my rights serve me well in God's providence. There's another right that belonged to a Roman citizen. Exemption from certain dishonoring or humiliating forms of punishment. It's a right that Paul makes use of in the text I just read to you from Acts 22, right before he scourged. That's why the tribune comes when he hears that a Roman citizen is about to be scourged. Roman citizens were not allowed to be humiliated that way. A third right that Paul makes use of is protection against summary execution and mob violence. Roman citizens had the right to request protection. And Paul does this in Ephesus, for example. Now, there's another interesting fact that you learn from about Paul's early uh, upbringing as, as Saul. This comes from Philippians chapter 3, 6, where Paul describes himself as a Hebrew born of Hebrews. F.F. F. Bruce is a noted New Testament scholar. He points out that both Luke and Paul reserve the word Hebrew for conservative Hebrew or Aramaic speaking Jews. And it would have been contrasted with Hellenistic or Greek speaking Jews in the diaspora. They would have been more, more in the majority. People who hung on to their Hebrew would have been rare. Bruce says, and I'm going to quote now for you, the distinction was cultural as well as linguistic. Hebrews attended synagogues where the service was conducted largely, if not wholly, in Hebrew. Their children were taught Hebrew. Hellenists, who were in the majority in the diaspora, spoke Greek. They attended synagogues where the scriptures were read and prayers were recited in Greek. Their children, though learning some Hebrew, probably never became fluent in it and mostly spoke and learned their lessons from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of what we call today the Hebrew Bible. In the dispersion, the Hellenists were the majority of resident Jews, the Hebrews either recent immigrants from Israel, or more likely in Paul's case, members of families, which made a special point of preserving their Hebrew ways. That's the end of Bruce's quote. So it's likely, what he's saying is, it's likely that Paul was brought up by conservative Jews, conservative Jewish parents. And they sought for their son a real knowledge and loyalty to the three pillars of Judaism in the first century, the Torah, the temple, the tradition. As far as we know, Paul had no brothers, but did you know he had a sister? She's mentioned in Acts 23 in verse 16. You can look it up later on. So um, just a little bit more about Paul's family. In a speech that Luke records in Acts 23, 
he not only calls himself a Pharisee, he also calls himself a son of Pharisees. So not only were his parents conservative Jews, but they belonged to the conservative religious party that we talked about when we talked about the world in the New Testament. They were Pharisees. He's a son of the Pharisees, a son of Pharisees, he said. It means his father, at least, was a Pharisee, probably his grandfather before him. As the son of a Pharisee, it was apparently Saul's father's wish that he be sent, and Saul's father had the economic means to do this, that Saul be sent to Jerusalem to study the Torah and worship in the temple and learn the traditions of Judaism at the feet of the rabbi Gamaliel, who's called in rabbinical literature, Gamaliel the first or Gamaliel the elder. We know Gamaliel was one of the leading rabbis of his day for according to the, the Mishnah, remember we talked about that when we talked about Jewish literature in the world behind the New Testament. In the Mishnah, this is what it says about Rabbi Gamaliel, Paul's teacher. This is an exact quote from Mishnah Sota, chapter nine. When Rabbi Gamaliel the elder died, the glory of the Torah ceased and purity and separateness died with him. That is Pharisaic language, folks. When Rabbi Gamaliel the elder died, the glory of the Torah ceased. It's proper interpretation. The glory that came out of it when it was properly interpreted as Rabbi Gamaliel the elder interpreted, that, that ceased and, and purity and separateness. Well, those words define what a, a Pharisee really was trying to achieve, purity and separateness from the people of the land and complete devotion to Torah, temple, and tradition. They ceased. In other words, because Paul was a Pharisee and the son of Pharisees, his family said, we're going to educate you in our family traditions, son. You're going to go and live with your sister in Jerusalem. And we have arranged for you to study with the Rabbi Gamaliel the Elder. The concern for purity, the concern to separate oneself from the Amharats, the people who just lived on the land but didn't study or honor the Torah. The decision to set one's life apart to discover the glory of the Torah through study and show forth that glory through a life of obedience to all the commandments of the Torah. These were the lessons that Gamaliel, the Pharisaic rabbi, would have passed on to his students, would have passed on to Saul. And Saul learned his lessons well. For as he says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 14, I advanced in Judaism. I was in the advanced class. I was in the advanced section. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my own people of the same age. Are you getting a picture of Saul now? Is it filling in for you? So when a messianic group, a group claiming they had found the Messiah, who followed a blasphemous rabbi named Jesus, Yeshua, continued to proclaim him as God's son after he was tried and condemned and crucified. Gamaliel took one kind of approach. It was very pragmatic. In Acts chapter 5, he says, I tell you, keep away from these men, just let them be. For if this plan or undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow it. But Saul, the student, trying to make a name for himself, took another approach and began, as Acts said, to breathe out threats and murder against the disciples of Jesus and to demonstrate his zeal for Torah and temple and tradition. Demonstrate his zeal by asking the religious authorities in Jerusalem and the high priest for a letter that he might go to Damascus and arrest any followers of this messianic pretender 
so they could be returned back to Jerusalem and stand trial as their Messiah had been for their blasphemous allegiance to someone who could call himself the Son of God. A love for Torah, a zeal for purity, the kind of obedience that separated him and set him apart from Jews who didn't take their religion so seriously. These were the trademarks of Saul's early life. As he sought to follow God's calling to him as a Pharisee. So now that I've moved through Saul's early life, I want to come on and talk with you about Saul's experience of the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. That's the second half of what I want to talk with you about tonight. We're right on track. Our survey of Saul's early life brought us, has brought us back to Acts chapter 9, and that's where we find the first of three accounts in the book of Acts of Saul's experience of the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. He's nearing his destination. And as you know, as he drew near to the city of Damascus, Paul received a revelation that ultimately led him to turn away from his purpose to persecute the followers of the way and instead unite with them. He was persecuting them. He was seeking to separate them from Judaism. And instead, at the end of this encounter, he unites with them. That's the etymological meaning of the word conversion, by the way. It comes from Latin. It comes from the Latin preposition con, C-O-N, which means with. And it comes from the Latin verb, vertere, V-E-R-T-E-R-E. -E -E. Vertere means to turn. To turn and unite with a group is to convert. Through his experience, Paul was turned, and he would become united with the followers of Jesus, the followers of the way. So to speak of Paul's conversion experience is certainly understandable when you look at it from the outside. But you have to look at it as more than his experience on the road to Damascus if you want to talk about his conversion. You have to talk about it not only in terms of what he experienced on the road to Damascus, you have to talk about it in terms of its ultimate result. Remember, Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9 is not completed until after Ananias who is a resident of the city of Damascus and a Christ follower, is called by the Lord to go and lay hands on Saul and speak with him. And only after that happens does Luke tell us that Saul rose and accepted baptism, which is the indication of the completion of his conversion, just like it is for us. When Jesus gives the great commission, what does he say? Go into all the world and make disciples from all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the sign of completion that belongs to the experience of conversion. That doesn't happen on the road to Damascus. It happens after Paul reaches Damascus and after Ananias bears a very reluctant witness to Saul. But suppose we adopt a different viewpoint. Instead of looking at Saul's conversion from the outside and calling it a conversion, which we can do as we look at the, the whole of Acts chapter 9, suppose we adopt a different viewpoint. If we look at Saul's experience, not from the position of an outsider, but from the inside, if we ask Paul to describe in his own words what happened to him on the road to Damascus, you might be surprised to learn that he's more than willing to tell us. He's more than willing to describe his experience for us. In fact, he does it in Galatians chapter 2, in verses 15 and 16. He's not talking to us, of course. He's talking to the Christians at Galatia, but we have the, the letter to the Galatians as part of our New Testament canon. So in terms of God's intention for those words, we're meant to hear them as Paul talking to us. Paul talks about his experience from, the, from an insider's perspective, from the one who actually experienced it. 
And he, he talks about it in three ways in those two verses in Galatians 2, 15 and 16. First, he does it by saying this. This is a quote from the, the passage in Galatians. First thing he says is, God, who had set me apart before I was born. Now, remember, a long time ago, I talked to you about something called intertextuality. Places in the New Testament where someone is consciously bringing up something from the Old Testament in some way. Paul knows his Old Testament better than many Old Testament professors would today. He knows it from memory, large parts of it. So when he says, God who had set me apart before I was born, he is echoing the prophetic call of the prophet Jeremiah. Because if you turn to the beginning of the book of the prophet Jeremiah, you will find out that is Jeremiah's experience. God set me apart before I was born. These are the words of Jeremiah in chapter 1. Before I formed you in the womb, God says to Jeremiah, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Yeah, the first part of what Paul says in Galatians 2 is echoing Jeremiah. The second way Paul describes his experience on the road to Damascus is to say that God, and I'm quoting now, called me through his grace. Called me through his grace. Grace is a word that's used in both the Old and the New Testaments to describe something God chooses to do, not in response to who we are or what we have done, but because of who God is and what God has decided to do in our lives. That's grace. The third way Paul describes his experience in Galatians 2, it's an experience of being set apart. And it's an experience that was planned for me, Paul says, before I was born. That's the first way he describes it. The second way he describes it is an experience of grace not in response to anything that I was or anything that I was doing, but because of who God is and what God decided to do with me in my life. And the third way that Paul describes his experience is to say that God was pleased to reveal his son, and most English translations say, to me. But the Greek that stands behind the English can mean to me, but much more often in terms of its use, would mean in me. So Paul would be saying, God was pleased to reveal his son in me. The word reveal means to unveil. Remember, we talked about that when we talked about the book of Revelation. Reveal means to take the veil off something. What Paul means when he says that God was pleased to reveal his son in me may well be that God was pleased to reveal Jesus in Paul by unveiling his identity in Paul's mind at that moment on the road to Damascus. And then in Paul further, as for three days he fasted after he reached Damascus. And finally in Paul, as Ananias came to him, laid hands on him, and the scales fell off Paul's eyes. In other words, what Paul may be trying to say is that God's unveiling of the identity of his son and uh, the way in which Paul came into relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ was a process, not a single event. So often we hear of a Damascus Road conversion, and we think of it as a, uh, an immediate event. But when you read carefully the book of Acts and Paul's own words, he doesn't describe it that way. He talks about it as a process. And how many more people have I talked to in my ministry, quite a few, who would describe their experience of coming to know Christ in a personal way as a process rather than a single event? Anyway, there you go.
With Paul's description then in our minds, for his firsthand witness and his firsthand testimony always has to be first in our minds when we talk about his experience on the road to Damascus. Now we can turn back to the three accounts of Paul's conversion that we read in Acts 9 and 22 and 26. Paul describes his experience as a call and a revelation. Luke provides no one single word to summarize what happened to Paul. Instead, what Luke offers us is a story. A story that's told three times because it's a recurring story in the book of Acts. It's not told in exactly the same way all three times, but the main points of the story all occur three times in a row. It is because this story is an important story, not only in terms of who Saul was and who Paul becomes, but for Luke, it is an important story in the overall story of what you might call the biography of the early church. Remember, the story of Saul who becomes Paul in his missionary journeys is going to take up the second half, the larger half of the book of Acts, which is Acts story of the emergence of the early church. Most people call the book of Acts a history, but I just called it a biography. I want you to understand why. Richard Burridge is a professor in, uh, in London, and uh, he has shown, uh, originally others have taken up his work, how the book of Acts shows many of the same characteristic features in terms of its genre as the Gospel of Luke and the other Gospels. He's done a detailed process of comparing all the Gospels in the book of Acts with ancient biographies, biographies that actually come from the first century and around the first century in Greek and Roman literature. And Richard Burridge has proved to most New Testament scholars that Acts is significantly, and perhaps even primarily, like biographical literature, as well as historical literature. He has also pointed out that the preface of the book of Acts talks about, as we said, all that Jesus began to do and teach. And he has suggested to the New Testament community of scholars that for Luke, the two-part work that Luke writes, that we call the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, form one biography of Jesus, indicating both his earthly acts in his incarnation and his acts as the risen Lord through the Spirit and his delegates who are called apostles those to whom he appears after his resurrection and to whom he delegates the task of proclaiming the gospel. So with that in mind, let's look at the story in Acts chapter 9. Luke introduces the story of Paul's experience in the road to Damascus in verses 1 and 2. We've already talked about most of what those verses say. When you compare this introduction in Acts 9 with the other two accounts in Acts of Paul speaking about his experience, you can see that Acts 9 is the primary one. The other two are introduced in ways that are appropriate to their different contexts, the situation in which they occur. In Acts 22, Paul is speaking to a Jewish audience, so he begins by rehearsing for them his Jewish background. He says in Acts 22, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, brought up in the city of Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel, educated strictly according to our ancestral law, yada, yada, yada. In Acts 26, speaking before a Hellenized Jewish king, Agrippa, empowered by G the Gentile Roman Empire, Paul begins his account of his conversion with a deferential prologue, recognizing Agrippa's knowledge of the customs and controversies of Judaism. But the two later accounts in Acts come together and align with the narrative story in Acts 9, which is the primary story in Luke and in the book of Acts of Paul's conversion. So let's look into it. Luke speaks first of how Saul is going to Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Each of those phrases deserves a little bit of reflection. The light from heaven is especially associated with the presence of God in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, in Isaiah, even in the creation account of Genesis. It's also associated with the presence of God in the New Testament. 
as for example, at the time of Jesus' birth. This light in Greek is a flashing light, is the way it's usually translated in English. It's not a common word at all. It isn't found very much at all. But it is found in another of the intertestamental books, the book of 4th Maccabees. And there it is called lightning. So I want you for imagine, to imagine for a moment that you're standing. And all of a sudden, a lightning storm erupts all around you, flashes of lightning all around you. Your English translation will say, suddenly a light flashed around him. But I want you to imagine what I think the Greek is picturing. Lightning flashes all around you. And along with the flashes of light comes a voice. Now, if you are thinking like a Pharisee, like a trained rabbi, you know where this imagery of lightning flashing and a voice coming, you know where that comes from. It comes from the account after Israel has come out of Egypt to Mount Sinai. It comes from the account of the giving of the law, the Torah. Lightning flashed, thunder clapped, the voice of God spoke. The people said to Moses, don't let God speak to us. You go up that mountain. And he did, and he received the Ten Commandments. Saul's experience on the road to Damascus, folks, same thing. Lightning flashes and a voice speaking. Wow. Imagine you're a, a, a rabbi who has treasured that account in Exodus of how the law was given. And it happens to you. And the voice says to you a message. And the message is in three parts. Part number one. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The first part of the message is a question. In the question, as we'll see in a minute, are the seeds of some theological ideas that are foundational to Pauline theology when they're joined with the second part of Jesus' response. But for now, it's worthwhile to notice the question does two things. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It calls Saul by name. That's the first thing that it does. And the second thing that it does, it prompts Saul to ask a question. Who are you, Lord? That's a logical question because Saul recognizes the voice that's speaking to him. There's more. The voice which calls Saul by name. Hmm. Again, you got to think like you're a Jewish rabbi. Like you know your Old Testament really well, and I know all of you do. Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli. He said, you called me, Eli. And Eli said, no, I didn't call you, Samuel. Go back and go to sleep. And he tried, but the voice spoke to him again, called his name. Samuel, Samuel. He got up and went to Eli. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling Samuel. He said, go back, Samuel. When the voice speaks to you again, say these words. Speak, Lord for your servant is listening. When Joe led us in prayer before he talked to us last week, he used that as the, the prayer of illumination. It's great prayer of illumination, biblical prayer of illumination. But it is also, also exactly Saul's experience on the road to Damascus. A voice speaks like the voice that spoke to Samuel, calls him by name, but there's only a voice, there's no person. The voice that calls Saul by name is also accompanied by the flashing light, the lightning flashes. Wow. Those are the two parts that form the first part of the message. 
that comes to uh, Saul on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Second part of the message. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Saul had asked, who are you, Lord? The voice says what Saul expected. Yahweh, I am. And then it says what Saul didn't expect. Jesus. Yahweh, Yeshua, whom you're persecuting. The voice identifies itself in both those two ways. As the great I am. The self-identification, the name of God given to Moses. And second, with the name of a man called Yeshua, a man called Jesus. And when those two names come together in one simple sentence, the significance of identifying the Lord with Jesus becomes a reality for Paul, begins to become a reality for Paul. I am Jesus. In those words, Saul recognizes for the first time that there is an identity, a union, a unity between the Lord revealed in the law and the prophets and a man called Yeshua, Jesus. For the first time, Paul is presented with the union between those two, with the knowledge that Jesus is indeed the Mashiach, the Son of God. Up until this moment, Paul had been thinking of Jesus as clearly, apparently, self-evidently, a messianic pretender. Now he sees and hears that Jesus, who was rejected by the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem and the high priest and put to death, has been exalted by Yahweh and can display the same kind of divine power and use the divine name and appear and speak in the same way as the Lord spoke to Moses and the Lord spoke to Samuel. As the Lord spoke to the one who gave the law and the second great prophet of Israel. This is the way Paul will later tell the Galatians that God was pleased to reveal his son in me. This revelation, this unveiling of Jesus' identity stands at the center of Pauline theology. In Philippians 2, Paul will conclude what is the earliest confession of the New Testament about Christ by saying, at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus, Messiah, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now let's turn to another point. At the moment Jesus says to him, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, Saul was, of course, not persecuting Jesus. He was not. Jesus was no longer alive. He was no longer incarnate. How could Saul persecute Jesus? Saul was persecuting Jesus' followers. And the voice of the risen Christ implies there is the closest possible identification between the followers of Jesus that Paul was persecuting and the risen Christ. Don't read past that too quickly. The closest possible identification between Jesus and his followers. Jesus identifies himself with you and me. They are part of who I am. They're part of, part of my body, is the way Paul will theologize it in 1 Corinthians. Paul will also talk later about being in Christ, Christian believers, being in Christ, living in complete union with Christ not as a result of what we do, but by grace, because Christ chooses to live in us through the presence of his spirit. There's a wonderful um, Korean professor of New Testament at Fuller Theological Seminary, and uh, he's still teaching. His name is Soyun Kim. He wrote a book um, that grew out of his doctoral thesis called The Origin of Paul's Gospel. And in the book, what he said is that the idea of a real and intimate union of Jesus with Paul and other Christian believers begins with these words of Jesus. 
and with Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. The whole of Paul's ecclesiology, his understanding of what the church is, his understanding of who we are as believers, um, grows out of this experience for him. And what he says to us when we understand it is something we need to deeply understand. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. I don't know how often you, you let that thought pass through your mind, but Paul let it pass through his mind quite a lot. It transformed him. Um, we are Jesus' hands and feet in mission. We are the people whom Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We are the people to do the baptizing. We are the people to do the teaching, all that he commanded. Jesus' words revealed to Saul at that moment that Jesus was indeed Lord. He unveiled what that meant. And those words would continue to reverberate in his mind and, and out of his mind and his letters as he grew in his understanding with the help of the Holy Spirit and as he developed what we've come to call Pauline theology. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks not only about believers as being in Christ individually and collectively, he also talks about the community of believers as the body of Christ. There's one more thing that Jesus says to Paul on the road to Damascus. You will be told what you are to do. There's every reason to believe that Saul understood these words as a divine call. Like the call of Moses. Like the call of an Old Testament prophet. You will be told what you are to do. Jeremiah, I want you to go down to uh, the potter's house. It was Jeremiah's call. The voice said to Paul, I'm going to tell you something and you're going to do it for me. You'll be told what you are to do. Paul, in fact, defends his apostleship when he is questioned on the basis of two facts. When you join them together, they validate his apostleship. One, he, is, he has experienced the risen Christ. Two, he has been called by the risen Christ as a delegate to act in Christ's place and do what Jesus tells him he is supposed to do. The commission is communicated in an open-ended way. You'll be told what you are to do. But Paul's words in Galatians leave us in no doubt. Paul was commissioned, as Galatians says, so that I might proclaim, that's a direct quote, so that I might proclaim Jesus as God's son among the Gentiles. Or as Luke says in Acts 26, when he redoes Paul's conversion account, pardon me, there we go. Paul speaking to Agrippa is recounting his conversion and recounting what Jesus says to him. And in the account in Acts 26 is a fuller version. I've appeared to you for this purpose, Jesus says to Paul, to appoint you to serve and testify to the things which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Friends, that's Paul um, just taking Jesus' words. You'll be told what you are to do. And uh, in Acts 26, toward the end of his public ministry, after he's made three missionary journeys and been arrested in Jerusalem and is standing before Agrippa, he understands now what Jesus meant when he says, you'll be told what you are to do. And he understands what Jesus' delegation of him has produced in his life. Each of you, like me, um, belong to Christ. We call ourselves um, servants. And um, we, need to, we need to think about what Christ is calling us to do in our lives. Um, that's what it means to be a, a, a missional church. So with that, I'll close. Um, it's about two minutes after eight, and I'll unmute you all and uh, see what you'd like to talk about based on all that input. And again, I know it's a lot, and I'm sorry I don't have any cool slides, um, but uh, I will put the whole thing up for you. And uh, that should give you an opportunity to interact with it a little bit more fully. And of course, 
like Joe, like Tyler, like John, uh, like Rich. Um, we're all happy to interact with you if you want to email us afterwards and, and ask questions that occur to you. I know I'm speaking for all of us when I say that. Okay, here comes the unmute. You're live. Except for some people have themselves muted. Carol Sakovich, John Haberlin, and Helen Pat, you all have yourself. And Barbara Stark, you all have yourself. And Marge, you all have yourself muted. Larry and Marge. Jim. Yeah. This is Pat. Pat. That clarification at the end was so well done. I mean, for you to have pulled all those pieces together, um, that was wow. It really was wow. I, I really, that, that really struck through to me. Thank you. You're welcome. It's, it's wow to me every time I say it. You might think that, and I'm, I'm sure this is true for all the preachers in the audience, you know, we say things. And while we're saying them, it wows us. You think we we made it up so we can wow you, but you know it. It's um, we preach to ourselves a lot, and uh, when we get excited about something, it's usually because God's been speaking to us through it, and we want you to hear the same thing because it gets us excited. Well, we all know the passages, and we've gone through them separately, but to tie them together, the clarification is just beyond um, doubt. You know, it's just, it's phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad God's Spirit's helping make that clear. Larry and Mark, and John Hammond, and Barbara Stark, you got to unmute yourself. Hi, Hi. The little <laughs> Little microphone down in the bottom left or something like that. Anyway, um, somebody else, what kind of comments you got? Tyler was Kim uh, teaching when you were there. What's that? Was so you and Kim teaching when you were there? Oh, um, yeah, I never, I never had a class, um, unfortunately, but yeah. Um, certainly know the name. Yeah. Very humble guy. Very, um, um, so many of the Korean Presbyterians are just so refreshing to listen to in terms of their faith. He always was. Wow. Jim, I have a question. Okay. Um, I was interested in what you were talking about, how the risen Christ's, connected himself with the body um, in those words talking about the persecution. Would you just talk, talk more about that connection a little bit? Yeah, I think, you know, when, um, when Jesus says to, to Saul, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, we just kind of read right past that without thinking about it. And um, Saul is not persecuting Jesus. I mean, it, it's, it's, just flat out obvious. Jesus isn't there to persecute. Uh, Paul is persecuting Jesus' people. And so you can contemporize that. Um, and Tyler said this in more than one of his sermons. Um, we believe in America that we're persecuted because we're in the minority now and no longer the uh, denominational church of the 1950s. Um, but we aren't persecuted, and, and you know that, Becky, and, and uh, so does everybody sitting here listening to me. Um, and um, missions like the International Justice Mission continue to help make that clear as they have in, in uh, Tyler and Brittany's lives. Um, Jesus identifies himself deeply with people who are persecuted. And um, we, are, we are one body um, of Jesus' followers followers of the way, no matter what we call ourselves Presbyterians or no matter where we live. And so um, what happens to one part of the body uh, should affect all and certainly affects the, the one who's the head of the body, um, who is Christ. Um, and we should identify with them. We should find ways in which we can, um, in which we can uh, pray and tangibly help and work for justice for them. 
Jim, we so, got, oh, go ahead, Becky. Just, so it, it seemed like what he was saying was that there was more than just a sort of identification between the risen Christ and the people, um, persecuted or not. Is it, is there something mystical going on here? More than just um, sort of an identification Kind of an idea identification. I think the identification is real, uh, you know, um, and it would be fun to toss this back and forth because you and I are reaching toward the same thing. Um, I think when you say, um, I am, um, and identify yourself as closely as Jesus does here with uh, the body of uh, his church, which Saul has been persecuting. It's a mystical union. That's the, what the hymn talks about when mystic sweet communion with those whose work is done. Um, it's the same as the communion of the saints that we celebrate in the Apostles' Creed. Um, this is this kind of close union between Jesus and his people. And um, there's a lot that gets built out of that in Pauline theology. I mean, you know, Paul's ecclesiology, his idea of the church is what gets built out of that. But it all starts here. And that's what I find so fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Jim, I was just going to say, Margaret, did you mean to send that to the group? You had a question. Or just about, about Messiah and all that. Let me pick it up. Okay, she's um is it chat isn't chat? Th th yeah, well I think it just came to me, but thumbs okay. up, yeah. Cool to read the question. All right. Yeah. Um Margaret said, Did the Jewish people understand Messiah was one with Yahweh or just a new anointed king? Great question. And the answer is is not going to be any one thing. Um the ideas that were rolling around about the one that God would anoint. Um, ran the gamut uh, as far as we can tell in the intertestamental period and in the first century and really um, so when Jesus comes along and um, allows himself to be identified in the middle of his public ministry by his disciples in a private setting as the Messiah and then asks them to tell no one this is called the, the messianic secret. And the reason that he wants it kept secret is not because he doesn't want it to be known, but because ideas about the Messiah vary so widely among the Jews. Um, for many, the Messiah was going to be a political force um, who would uh, begin the, the remaking of uh, not only Israel, but uh, the whole of God's kingdom in a very uh, earthy, very political way. Um, was he called the son of God? Yeah. You can find references in the intertestamental literature that'll do that. Um, do they mean what we mean by son of God? Do they mean divine? Not necessarily. Or maybe they did. Um, even though we got this literature, we don't have the people who around who wrote it, wrote it to tell us exactly what they think it meant. So, um, Messiah is a very, um, it's a, a very, has a, a wide range of meanings. But I, I guarantee you when Paul, the Jewish rabbi, heard Yahweh, I am, in the context of flashing lightning and a voice coming from heaven, like the lightning that flashed around Mount Sinai and the voice that came to Moses, he knew who was talking to him. And then the next thing is the word, the name of the person that you you know, you know, you're a student. You're not just, you know, not just an ordinary Jew. You're someone who has studied the Torah. You know what it says. And you know beyond the shadow of a doubt. This is a messianic pretender. Deuteronomy 21 says, cursed be a body that hangs on a tree. And later on that, Paul is going to understand that's true. He doesn't, it completes the meaning of Deuteronomy. It doesn't go against it. Um, but his curse is not a curse that God lays upon him for who he is. It's a curse that God lays upon him in order that we might become his body. 
And that's really powerful. I mean, you know, wow. Think about, think about the completion of the Old Testament like that. Think about fulfillment like that. And go back and read Matthew's fulfillment quotations. We think, oh, isn't that great? You know, prophecy was fulfilled, you know, and what they were looking forward to in the future. But let those things speak to you as they would have spoken to those people, um, as they would have spoken to Paul. and See how it, it would have changed around. And um, I don't know. It's like when something comes clear to you, and it just it changes it just transforms the way you've been thinking about something that's what happened to paul yeah joe you need to unmute yourself oh i, th I think you have to allow participants to unmute themselves I thought I unmuted everybody. there's, there's an option on that um yep unmute all and then there's like a allow participants to unmute themselves. There we go. There we go. All right. Here's so <laughs> real quick, um, there's there's libraries full of um, discussions and theories about who Theophilus is. You know, is he a God lover in general? Is he a real yep. God? Is he yep. this or is he that? Just what's your best shot at who Theophilus is? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you've just given it. <laughs> You know, um, it really is going to be—it really is going to be impossible to say whether it's an individual or whether it's a. a written I was hoping you'd finally clarify. Yeah, no, can't do it for you. Can't do it for you. Oh, nuts! <laughs> it might be. You know, it might not be an even or. And I know, I know. That's there's might be both seven hands. theories on that one too. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Jim? Yeah. If the I am there is not just a grammatical thing that we use to say I am Pam or something like that, then why in the New Testament, in the passages in Acts, doesn't it? I mean, I realize that when you capitalize both the words, that it's something that they've done in English, but there's nothing really to designate to the common person that that would be speaking of the I am as the Messiah or what you're relating. It seems like to us, it just seems like you would be saying like, I am, I am Jesus. I mean, it doesn't seem to relate to say that he would be what Paul would be considering God, the great I am that is in the Old Testament. Yeah. And, um, I don't know, you might find it in some study Bibles, but I imagine it would most likely be in commentaries. And the reason, Pam, is because the meaning of ego eimi, which are the Greek words I am in Acts chapter nine, depend upon context. One of the principles for determining the meaning of words in the Hebrew Bible or in the Greek Bible is contextual meaning, meaning that's derived from the context. So you have to ask, when you hear the words I am in the context of flashing lightning and a voice that comes from heaven, um, mm -hmm. what do those words mean? And so that's the way I painted it for you tonight. Um, words derive their meaning from, from the context in which they're spoken. And that's a principle of uh, uh, word study and linguistics. And I think we need to honor it in Acts chapter nine. So that's why I think, I think we can hear it, but you need somebody to explain that to you or a note in a study Bible to explain it to you. And you're right, you just can't get it all across in an English translation. You just read right past it. This is great interaction, thank you. <laughs> so to really understand Paul's conversion, you really have to go into his further relationship with Cornelius and yeah, you know, Pam, you've got this fellow who knows Greek sitting right there next to you again. <laughs> we need to work with you a little bit. Did you? Did you? Were you two uh, study partners in when you learned Greek, John? No, I learned Greek okay. in college. Okay. Yeah, and then yeah. I know so many people who have uh, have spouses, and all they've done is teach the spouse the Greek alphabet, so they can um, look at the word and pronounce it, and that's the way they learn vocabulary. 
Yeah, no, she has heard too many sermons where I tend to refer to Greek every once in a while <laughs> for those who know me. <laughs> yeah. But you see, it, ego amy, it, it, it's used a lot and it means it, it doesn't mean anything special. But in this context, absolutely it means something special because words depend not on the dictionary definition, but you know, English words work the same way. You know, they've got two or three definitions. Which one do you use? Well, it depends on the context. That's what we say, right? Same thing with Greek, same thing with Hebrew. Um, you get, you go to a, a Greek or Hebrew dictionary, you get two or three or five or 10 or however many possibilities there are for the meaning of any given word, but you have to determine the meaning in context. And that's why the context is so important in Acts 9, but we tend to read right past it as though you get wowed by the, uh, the light show and um, you don't connect it with the, with the speech, and we've got to connect it with the speech. That's what's so important to do. Right. If I could just pop something in here. I think that uh, when he says, I am Yahshua, uh, that's, that's powerful. Because if you were any sort of a Hebrew, you would understand that Yah is Yahweh and Shua is salvation. So when he says, I am Yahshua, he is uh, identifying <coughs> that um, he is salvation. Yeah, I mean, you can think about how Paul would have ruminated around this. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, um, suppose there was a pause. I mean, we read that. In, when we read our English Bible and we say, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And we're reading along from left to right. You know, we want to get through the story. But um, so many of the biblical stories um, will really open up if you, if you uh, allow your imagination to say, what tone of voice was that said? In? Where were the pauses? Because there's no punctuation in Hebrew or Greek, right? Where did somebody pause? Because we know that as the book of Acts or what name Paul's letters would have been read, they would have been read in a, a church, a house church by a lector, by somebody who had looked them over and um, knew the story and wasn't reading it for the first time and was trying to read it with, uh, with feeling so that people would hear it, hear the voice coming through it. So was there a pause after I am? I am. Yeshua. And of course that means I am salvation as well as i am jesus and you know paul had three days to to think about it. there weren't a lot of words spoken he had three days to reflect on something that we read in uh i don't know maybe two seconds and out of that grew so much pauline theology so jim i appreciated all of the youth um the background you gave on Saul before he became Paul. Mm -hmm. So I liked all that, but I was wondering since all of the studies that he did was he, he was never like ordained as a rabbi or, but he was qualified to be one, right? Yeah. And there's really no such thing as ordination. Mm -hmm. um, it is um, to become a rabbi. You need to become the disciple of a rabbi. And when the rabbi says you're a rabbi, you're a rabbi. Oh. <laughs> it I mean, actually is a whole lot like PhD studies. Because <laughs> <laughs> the end of your PhD study, after you've done your thesis, you have what's called an oral exam. And uh, <laughs> there are three rabbis sitting in there. Uh, I had uh, one woman rabbi from Cambridge and, and two men rabbis from the University of Nottingham. And uh, uh, they uh, asked me a whole bunch of questions, sent me out in the hall for too long a time, longest minutes of my life, called me back and said, you're a rabbi. <laughs> you know, you've got a PhD, you know. yeah. but that's kind of the way it was done. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not like, um, not like we think of ordination with laying on of hands and everything when you see somebody uh, called to the minister in a church. And that's a great question to ask because that's what everybody would normally think, exactly right. what you said. And, and hopefully I've been able to help you see a different way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Who's on next week? Me. Oh, the fellow who learned Greek in college. 
John Haberlin is going to talk about uh, Mark and Barnabas, you know, because out of, after this conversion, Paul hooks up with a couple of characters and uh, okay. they become really important. And uh, John said, you know, I gave him the whole book of Acts and said, what would you like to talk about? And he said, I would love to talk about Mark and Barnabas. So I know you're going to be uh, blessed by what he has to share next week. So be sure to tune in for the next section of Acts. And uh, I've been able to get Bill Kettnering to uh, contribute to the, our study of the book of Acts. And he's going to do something on um, the apostolic council and James and uh, the relationship between Christianity and Judaism. And he's going to do the fourth week. There's the fifth uh, week, the fifth Monday in, uh, in this month. And so I haven't got the fifth Monday lined up yet. No, I'll work on that. We'll get it done. Hey, we've got a pastor. I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> I'm teasing Tyler. <laughs> we've got a pastor. He can oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I said to him when we started this, I said, you know, um, please, whenever you want to contribute and, and you get the say on this and, um, <laughs> but you know, I don't want to. I don't want to add something more to what you're already doing, unless you want to be. want it to be added. So I let him call the shots on that. Just teasing him. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Okay, I'll stop the recording. Okay.